H. Lee Barnes, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. And um, you served in Vietnam. You've written some books, fiction and nonfiction about your time in Vietnam. You also served in the Dominican Republic. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, both of those topics. Um, but let's just start with when you got into the Army and, and why. Well, it, 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 I, that was still when the uh, draft was active and I was uh, out of school. I just I had to drop out of college for that because I ran out of money. And I got, got re, uh, reassigned my draft status. And so I got a notice. When I got the notice, I decided that I would go down and talk to a recruiter and see what could what could come of that. I went into his office and we went through all of the different possibilities. And and he said, uh, "Do you want to go airborne?" And I said, "What's airborne?" And he said, mm -hmm. "You know, a paratrooper." And I said, "Why would I want to do that?" <laughs> and he said, "Fifty-five dollars a month." <laughs> well. Well, at the time when you went to the service, then it was like yeah, the base pay was for a private was about fifty nine dollars a month. So wow. I, I figured I was I would be doubling my income. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I went, ahead, I went ahead and signed up airborne, and then went yeah. to basic from from there. And, well, and that was in November of nineteen sixty three. November of sixty three. Um, do you happen to remember the particular day? I I believe it was November eleventh uh, of. Uh, yeah, when I went and talked to him, it was about November 11th, so just, uh, 1963, and I was actually inducted um, four days before. So I think Kennedy was assassinated. I think on the 22nd. Yeah, uh, and I, I, so I actually went in on the 18th of November. That's why I was asking you about this, the particular date. So you were, you were in boot camp when Kennedy was assassinated. Yeah, and everything they shut everything down, uh, and. Uh, Obviously, they couldn't use us because we were raw recruits, but they had us on um, standby status anyhow. Uh, for fear that maybe some sort of, you know, broader operation was was afoot. Well, it would, yeah, that, that's all it was. It was that's that would be natural for the military if anything happened with any president. It was for the military to go on standby, and yeah. I, I guess it's everybody. Uh, standby meaning that they canceled all of uh, any leaves that anybody would have had or or, or passes to get out of cl uh, out of the camp. Right. Uh, and yeah. this is important for Louisiana. Yeah. Um, um, Vietnam veterans, I've heard several times, um, have said to me over the years, you know, I think thinking of John F. Kennedy um, as a personality, uh, John F. Kennedy's, you know, memorable inaugural address, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Uh, over the years, a number of veterans have told me how inspired they were by Kennedy. Did, how about you? What, did, did you feel that yourself? Uh, oh, yes. I, I, well, I came from that generation. He spoke to us in a special way. But yeah. even beyond that, because I, I ended up in special forces, uh, he was the one who who came to Fort Bragg and went to the Gabriel, James Gabriel demonstration area and saw what we could do. And he granted us the beret. And so for wow. until until everybody in the military now wears a beret, I mean, we were the only unit that had a beret. And it, uh, we had been wearing them, or people in Special Forces had been wearing them, but, but he made it official that it, it was part of our, our uniform. Oh, so even so, that, even that, that part of your identity, you, you attach that part of your identity in your mind to President Kennedy. Oh, yeah. And, and if, I think, if, you don't, if I'm not mistaken, that if you look at his, where his burial site and everything, that on top of uh, the, the, the casket or whatever he's I, I forget what they're called anyhow he I think you'll see a beret on that every year I think somebody from special forces goes there and replaces wow. them yeah yeah so just one more Kennedy related question and then we'll and then we'll move on it's a long time ago but do you have any recollection of um kind of the impact um that news of the assassination had on these raw recruits there 
Uh, no, uh, it's very. It, it, we were all co- a bit confused, be, simply because uh, they didn't really tell us why we were on standby for the first day and a half or so. Oh, oh, okay. and, and then we were told, and uh, all of us were anxious to get back to our uh, get into the training system, uh, but at the same time we were angry, uh, you know, because and confused. Why would uh, why would somebody want to kill? that president i mean yeah any president for that matter but in particular somebody who brought that much uh hope and light to the to the to the country yeah um so do do you feel then that that the assassination of kennedy kind of gave you and or the guys you were with an extra motivation to perform well during boot camp uh, I, that would be very difficult to say, you, you know, because boot camp is just, you know, get, you're in the army now. Right, yeah. Now, all right, you know. Yeah. If I call you a jerk, you're a jerk, you know. Right. So, so we didn't have time, I, I think, for that kind of abstract thinking. Right. Okay. I, I can say that certainly uh, most all of us felt a loss. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and, and, and of course... That, there was still a very strong anti-communist uh, sentiment uh, floating around the country then. Sure. And, uh, and so with the war in Vietnam, which had not accelerated to any degree at that time, right. uh, going on, it's, we still, still saw that, that, that people were, that, that was part of our duty if we were called upon to fight these communists. And, and we felt that the communists, had, you know, if we talked about it, yeah, well, the commies were behind it. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. And, and Did, of course, I've, I've since changed my mind. I actually think that Lee Harvey also just, a, he, he we've, the more assassinations we've seen and everything since then, I've, I've come to believe that these people are just, they live in their own kind of egocentric world and that that's, that they're fame seekers or they, they've got some kind of agenda that the rest of us can't under, quite understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there was an, another assassination um, about a month before President Kennedy's, um, and it was over in a place called Vietnam. And the guy who the guy who got assassinated was named No Dinh Diem. No Dinh Diem. Yeah. Did, did you have at that time? Did you have the slightest clue who No Dinh Diem was? Uh, actually, yes, I did, but not, did. not, 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 not the full meaning of what, who he was or anything like that. I just, I knew the name and I knew he was the, the president of, uh, Vietnam. And of course, it's since revealed that, uh, the CIA essentially okayed the assassination, which meant that the, the yeah. Kennedy had, uh, had approved it. Yeah. Do you, do you have a recollection of, you know, the, the famous image of, of, the, the Buddhists, you know, protesting the government of Diem in, in South Vietnam. Do you have any recollection of just, you know, of just being aware that there was this ferment in this place called Vietnam, that Buddhist priests were burning themselves alive to bring attention to the cause? Oh, yeah. I mean, I watched the evening news and I, I saw it. And, of course, it, you know, anybody that saw that would be repelled by it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's incomprehensible that somebody would, I mean, we understand suicide in different ways in this country. People hang themselves or shoot themselves. Yeah, uh, burning burning yourself um, to become a martyr is quite a quite a bit different. And I, I and but maybe maybe we could parallel what what uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did with it. I'm sure that in his perverse mind, he was thinking that he was in in a way a martyr, a political martyr, or mm. whatever. Yeah. Seek, or seeking or seeking uh, immortality through a single act. It's yeah. just, uh, it's all beyond me. Yeah. So you are generally, you know, you have some general sense that there's this ferment in Vietnam and there's this guy named Diem and, you know, there's trouble. So that's fact number one. Fact number two is I'm in the Army. In late 63, did it ever pass through your mind that somehow I might actually end up in Vietnam? Uh. I, there may have been the hauntings of it, yeah. but we, we were so we were kept so busy and 
exhaust and everything. And, and really, when you're in basic training or in AIT, uh, one of the most important things to you is to get your hands on a candy bar here and there just to get mm. <laughs> sugar in your system because you're, you're low on energy and get, you get a good night's sleep. I um, hear you, yeah. So, and, we, and we were isolated from any communication with the outside world. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because democracy has to be defended by sort of a dictatorial system, right? Uh, yeah, well, the military depends upon that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Um, well, so how, just tell us uh, briefly about the transition from soldier to special forces soldier, Green Beret. Uh, what, what, what happened was that the, this guy, it, Jimmy, Jimmy Christmas was his name. Oh, that's a great uh, name. A sergeant, yeah, and special forces came around with this beret and everything, and and told us about you know what it was, you know what what the unit did, sort of. Uh, and I, I remember I was, we were all gathered and seated uh, outside our barracks when he, when he was giving us this talk, and and I asked the question. I said, well, when you're in special forces, you have to K do KP, and he said, no, we don't do that sort of. Thing. <laughs> That's the kitchen so I said, kitchen work, I said, yeah. I'll sign up. I'll sign up. Wow! Uh, but you had to take a test, and uh, I knew it was it was a difficult test. There were fifty of us who took the test, at least fifty in that room. Yeah, and I was the only one that passed it. So wow! Uh, and, and this is was, an act. This is an a, an academic mental operations test. Uh, yeah, it was it was a critical situations evaluation test, which means that you were they they outlined a critical situation, and then they gave you. The best answer to the worst answer, and you had to uh, line them up in order. Oh, you couldn't wow. just say, "Oh, this is the best solution," or "That's the worst solution." You had to have all all four of them, if there were four of them, in the correct order. Wow! And I think there were I think there were about forty different situations you had to go through. It was oh, uh, just as an aside, I I am a member of Mensa and. Mm. I can tell you it's, it's more difficult than any of the uh, IQ tests I, I took in terms of demanding your attention. Well, that's interesting because it sounds like the test not only is testing your, your critical faculties, but is also testing your mental endurance. You're doing this 40, about 40 different times, right? I think a lot of folks after about 20 or so would say, that's enough, I'm done. Um, so it seems it sounds like it's like it's it's testing not just intelligence, critical thinking, but also a sort of intellectual endurance, mental endurance, which of course uh, is what yeah, they you, yeah you, they wanted your focus. They wanted you know you, if you have that kind of focus. And then the the thing is that the the the, the song that Barry Sadler sang rang true. Uh, you know, three the nine a hundred will test today. Only three will wear the green beret, mm. and that was statistically fairly accurate. Yeah, yeah. So you pass that test and does that mean then, okay, you're allowed to set one foot in, in the door, um, but there are a number of other challenges you have to face before you get to put on the beret? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to go through jump school, the three week of jump school. Um, yeah. and when I was in jump school, I was actually assigned to a stick, that's what they call them. Uh, yeah. And my stick leader was, was uh, James, uh, I think it's James John Carroll, who uh, uh, he was a, he was a Medal of Honor winner in Vietnam. Yeah, wow. Uh, Lieutenant, he was our stick leader, mm. and everybody else that was in there was part of Marine Force Recon. I was the only Army guy in there. Really? Wow. Yeah, and I could I could do better push-ups than they could. Uh -huh. So when you and more, and more because 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 the, the instructors in jump school kept called me smiley and every time every time they give me push ups to do I'd come up smiling and they so they'd make me do some more. Make, oh yeah, make you do more. So when did you actually get to put on the beret? Uh well you 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 get a beret without without the patch, the what we call the flash on it. Okay. Uh, when you go to training group. And uh, you have, you wear that beret uh, without the without the flash all the way through your training cycle, which it, depending on your MOS can be anywhere from from uh, five months or six months was about the about the shortest period of time, uh, all the way up to a year. The medics often took a took a year or more to get through the program because they had. They, they were not only trained at Bragg, they had to go through, I think it was three months at uh, 
in Texas uh, for the rest of their training. Yeah. I was a dem demo man, so I get, uh, in order to, to get my flash, earn my flash and everything else, I had to go through uh, the basic course that we had there, the what we, they call the branch training, and then I had to do 10 weeks of, of combat engineer demo training that was very specific, specifically designed for people in special forces. Yeah. We were in. And then I had to do, uh, I think it was uh, three months at Fort Belfort, Virginia. So by the time I got through, I, it was almost a year. And and by the way, we did do KP. Oh, you we did? did oh. We did KP in training group. So Sergeant, <laughs> Sergeant Christmas mis misled you. He did. Oh, he, boy. So by the he, time... He, so it's by, a self-serving lie. Yeah. Well, so by the time you are now, uh, you know, a member of Army Special Forces, you've, you've made it through. We're in late 64 then? Uh, no, actually early 65. Early 65. Yeah. So then, okay, so that brings us to the Dominican Republic. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to talk to you about um, Vietnam, but also as we'll do in a separate conversation, but... But now turning to the Dominican Republic, because, you know, I've taught modern history and U.S. history uh, for 22 years, and I don't think I've ever said a single word in any of my classes about the Dominican Republic operation. And, and I, I read Vietnam veterans' memoirs, and sometimes it's mentioned. I know that President Johnson gave you know, gave like a 20-minute talk uh, to the country on troops going into the Dominican Republic, but this really is an operation that has uh, slipped in, into the memory hole, and so this is why I'm, I'm glad to talk to you about it. So my understanding is that, um, well, I mean, I, I, I'll ask you, but my, my understanding is that um, it's the spring of 65 when the U.S. sends forces into the, the Dominican Republic, and was, did, did that include you? Or did you go in early in, in April 65? Right off the bat. I had, I had been back in training. I had been assigned to seven special forces for about a, barely a month uh, when, when they called us out in formation. Um, didn't tell us what was going on exactly. They told us, bring your TO, you know, theater of operation gear with you. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we brought our rucksacks out and the weapons were assigned and everything else. And it wasn't until we were in formation that uh, they, they told us that we were selected. My, my B team, which meant my four A, the four A teams, the A team I was on, yeah. from e, e Company, the seven special forces, uh, we were selected to go down and we were taken uh, immediately to, or transported immediately to Pope Air Force Base where we were given all the shots right there in, in the open field. There were medics uh, giving us, uh, you know, the, everything, uh, every, inoculating us against all the potential diseases that they could. Yeah. And yeah. Then, we got on, then we got on an airplane and we flew from there to, uh, from Pope Air Force Base down to Florida where they refueled. And then we flew directly into, uh, into the Dominican Republic. Now, in the meantime, we had already been informed that uh, the Marines had landed and, and secured the embassy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, of course, they, that, that's what Marines do. They go to the embassy right away, and then the second thing they do is get their cameras off, take pictures of each other. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and but the 82nd, uh, I believe it was uh, – C Company of the 504th of the 82nd Airborne, might have been the 503rd, uh, had already landed. And uh, keep in mind that this was all approved through the Organization of American States. It wasn't just uh, 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 Johnson acting independently of, of everything uh, and making a decision as uh, Reagan did to go into into uh, Grenada. Right. Instead. Instead, it was it was in response to a, a, a treaty that we had with the Organization of American States. Oh, okay. And, and Dominican Republic had been uh, for many years. It was under uh, the, the dictatorship of uh, Juan Trujillo, uh -huh. and and so what this was there was a vacuum when Trujillo uh, he either died or left. I can't remember. And uh, yeah, 
in that part of it. But uh, the new president that, that took over anything uh, essentially be, started becoming a dictator. And uh, the concern, the great concern for America, more than the uh, Latin American countries, was that, uh, that it was going to end up being another Cuba. Mm, and that, there's, right. that Cubans, Cubans were going to come in and infiltrate all of this. So mm. the 82nd landed, and the what they immediately did was they 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 crossed the bridge into Santo Domingo and began separating the the forces. They set up a in in the process taking casualties too. I mean, I I can't remember. There were 28 or 29 uh, Americans killed there, and and. Uh, I think there were actually more wounded there than were wounded in the in the uh, first Gulf War. Really? Wow! Um, yeah. And casualties, but it, nobody back in the states knew anything about this. Point. Yeah. But they set a uh, a buffer zone between them, and then we went right in behind uh, behind them. We they put us in a deuce and a half my uh, my my A team. And we went in behind them and crossed uh, up the bridge over. And as we were going across, the rebels that were on one side. Uh, uh, and securing a, the, that area of the bay as well, started firing 50 calibers at us. And, wow. I'll never forget, this This is one of the funniest uh, lines I've ever heard. Uh, uh, the, when, when we got to the, uh, here's this here's this guy with the 82nd, that, I mean, he's a transport person. He's not really a combat soldier as such. Yeah. When we sit down there, who drove us across, and he gets us on the other side, he says, Good luck. I wouldn't want to be you guys. And I was thinking, try back and forth on the bridge, getting shot at. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, now, just, so, are, are you are you confident that so what you're describing is a country in a state of civil war, and you know you're uh, you're, you're trying to you know you're working to help separate these sides, but the 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 side that's shooting at you, are you confident that they knew you were Americans? Uh, yeah. They know we were Americans. Absolutely. Oh. Okay. So, yeah, that was the rebel sector. The other, uh, West Oeste, the Air Force general, had control of the government forces. And really, what he wanted to do was we and and the people that supported him is he wanted to reestablish a true democracy. Yeah. Uh, because and, and I think anyhow, it all got very confusing as Latin American politics is confusing. Yeah. You know, ours is getting more and more confusing that way too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wow. But but in the in the process of going in there and everything, we really didn't have a specific assignment for a while hmm. uh, and that we knew when we got in there. So when we got in there, uh, we were split up in in fours, our A team, uh, and I don't know why they. Split, but anyhow, uh, two of us two of us were assigned to, and this really irks me to do uh, essentially bodyguard work for these Navy SEALs. Really? Who had a who had a Ooh. who had a who had a rifle with it with the with the first Starlight scope and and they were there to to snipe people on the rebel sides who uh, if they saw them with with guns and here it was the Navy had these I mean we were perfectly capable of shooting a, a rifle yeah but, but they, they they sent the they sent the seals in and they they got equipment that we did not yet have oh. Uh, so uh, it was kind of a, and of course they, I'd send my memoir, but uh, yeah, I, I think there were three of us that were there watching watching these seals. Maybe there's two or three, I can't remember. But anyhow, they when they weren't shooting at somebody or eating, they were they were doing sit ups or push ups, and of oh. course we got to kick out of that. Yeah. So wait. All right. So so they've got seals in, and these seals that you're with, the or that you're you're yeah. I mean you're 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 in operations with him. They are serving as snipers. Um, you've got the um, the rebel forces, and so if the, the the seals are acting as snipers, and then and then you guys, the Green Berets, are tasked to be basically security for the seals. <laughs> I'm sorry, that that's the way it rang out. That has that has. I, I have no idea what it's like to be a special forces soldier, but that has got to be incredibly galling. <laughs> Yeah, and, and of course, there's still that same kind of, and and they call everybody special forces now or special ops, and there's a very distinct. We get offended because there's a very distinct that we are the only special forces. The others are are, are special units that mm. are trained, you know, and that's that they they all have. I, it's not that I don't think that the seals are very capable. They are. It's not. It's nothing like that. It's sure. just that 
the Navy gets everything first, and and the, and the Army have all the military uh, and the Marines get a, get everything last. Yeah. So we, we uh, have these we have these SEALs who are who are sniping. Did did you yourself um, did you find yourself in uh, basically a, a combat situation uh, yourself? Well, they were really nice. They let us take a turn with their their equipment. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. But, yeah. but we but we were very we were very discreet about uh, the use of the of the rifle. Yeah. Uh, it was it was designated very specifically to be used uh, if you saw somebody with a carrying a weapon. Yeah. And nobody else. So uh, okay. it, it, there was that. And then uh, what I haven't touched on is that. Uh, I, and I don't know the total casualties, but it certainly was in the thousands. There were, there was the smell of human uh, death mm. throughout. I mean, we were we were in this ho abandoned hotel, three stories up, and you could smell you could smell the the, the death all around us. Wow! And, yeah, uh, and and now, but now in terms of 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 your work and and the work of the team you're with um did you get into any firefight situations or uh, aside from providing security for these seals what what other sorts of of work well, did, did you do well there was one other operation that took place uh, and that is when and i can't go into details because we signed papers on this wow but, okay uh but the boats dominicana which was the radio station was held by the uh, rebels and they were sending propaganda over it and uh, and West AOS they wanted it silenced. He sent an aircraft in there to bomb it. Wow! And the aircraft and the aircraft were successful because the rebels had that had a couple of fifty calibers and they shot and scared them off. Wow. And of course, the Air, the Dominican Air Force was using uh, uh, American World War II aircraft. That's yeah. what they have fighters. Yeah. So. So our unit, our unit was assigned to go in and uh, and take care I'll of it. Take that out. Wow. And we took, we did take one casualty in that. You did. What? Um. Uh, not not dead. Not KIA wounded. Wounded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, wow. how long were you in the Dominican Republic? Uh, I was there for I was there for nearly three months. Uh, after that, they sent us up to the. Uh, I spent pretty much the rest of my time, uh, the next six, six to eight weeks, uh, on the border between Haiti, uh, that mountainous area uh, between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Uh, we were, we were. I spoke a little bit of Spanish, and uh, we were to gather intelligence about Cubans, you know, hay cubanos and la de, uh, you know, and ask us questions and yeah. the locals up there. So we got to. We got to, and I have to. I have to tell you that uh, the Dominican people, or at least my experience with them, is that they were they were among the finest people I, I ever I ever encountered. Mm. They, mm -hmm. you, you'd be in the mountains, and you we you know if we didn't have we were on obviously on on uh, rations that they that they gave sea rations, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes we didn't have those. And you would you would go in these people's houses you know, just to ask them questions or something, and they uh, they they cook some rice and beans for you, and and uh, and and offer you some of their espresso coffee. Mm, uh, yeah, which by the way was wonderful. I'm sure. And, uh, and so this is, I'm sorry, this is after then. It sounds like things have kind of calmed down a bit, and now the U.S. military presence is just sort of. Ensuring that things don't flare up again. Well, yeah, there was, yeah, there was that a lot of the eighty second, and I guess a contingent of Marines kind of stayed in the Dominican Republic or in Santo Domingo for a while, and but our our unit went out and and did this kind of work right. uh, because it had settled down, and yeah. uh, the Argentinian forces came. By the way, it, it, if you want to see some nice uniforms, it's the, uh, the Argentinian military that has the name. Yeah, they're, they're, private, they're private stress like generals. Really? Yeah. Um, wow. Hmm. But they they sh they showed they showed everything was under control. But we had we had uh, uh, the Argentine Argentines showed up. I think the I think some Brazilian the uh, Brazilian showed up, and uh, I 
I can't remember one of the Central American com- uh, countries oh. showed up. As, yeah. And, uh, I don't think any any Mexican soldiers ever showed up, but uh, uh, I think Chilean soldiers showed up too. So we had okay. once once they got there, everything had been already, already been pretty much the, the 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 war as such was over with uh, within the first three weeks, and they okay. they showed up. So I think the idea was to kind of let them. Uh, their, their presence and everything give assurance to the uh, to the Dominican people yeah. that it wasn't just Americans coming down there to invade them, that there right. was another country in there, and, yeah. and it, we want to stabilize everything. And of course they did. Right. Uh, the yeah. ultimate result was that uh, the Dominican Republic is a fairly prosperous country compared to, far and away compared to Haiti, Haiti which, office, uh, which occupies the rest of the, sure. the island of East Niola. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and uh, it, it, they export wonderful coffee and uh, fine baseball players. Yeah, yeah. And they, and they like America. They yeah. Like, you know, if you, if, if they, if, if you see a, a Latin uh, baseball player with yeah. an American name, you know, he's probably from the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Well, so you've you've just said two things that that have got me thinking now about your experience in in Vietnam. Um, and first of all, but though I'm glad that that you know about what you just said because it's a reminder that we we think of the Korean War as an American war, but it was actually a United Nations war. Um, this Dominican Republic thing, I mean, to the extent that it's thought about, and and I think you know it has been largely forgotten, um, but it's not just a U.S. action, it's the Organization of American States, and you mentioned some of these, these allies who come in. It, it makes me think of, um, of Vietnam, because my understanding is that uh, in your service in Vietnam, you, you worked among um, Australians. Is that, is, do I have that right? Uh, yeah, we actually kept two Australians at our camp. With the, the camp that we went into in Vietnam was was occupied uh, by a team uh, that was primarily uh, Australian and under the under the command of a Captain Vizikas, who was, I guess, a Hungarian immigrant into Australia. Yeah. And and I think I think it was actually uh, like seven seven or eight Australians and four Americans. And when we went in there, uh, two Australians remained behind at all times. Okay. Yeah, and so it's it's a reminder that you know uh, we think of the U.S. or the Vietnam conflict as primarily an American thing. Of course, we had our South Vietnamese allies, um, and then the Montagnards, who I know you worked with as well, and I'm eager to hear about that. But then there were there there were other allies. I'm sorry. Yeah, there were Filipinos and Koreans there too. Exactly, Filipinos, South Koreans, uh, New Zealand. I think had a small force. I think even the Thai. The Thai military played a role, and the and the Australians. So let's let's come to to Vietnam. If I understand correctly, um, you were actually in the Dominican Republic when you decided that you'd had enough of that, and that you actually wanted to volunteer to go to Vietnam. Actually, it, 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 it's less close. Um, okay. I came back, and they were going to they were retraining us, giving us putting us through advanced. A more advanced uh, language school, so we'd go down there and speak uh, Spanish. Okay. And fit in, and they were going to send us back to the Dominican Republic. And of course, things had heated up in in Vietnam to the degree that uh, it was. We understood that it was a full scale war. I mean, that that was after the Gulf of Tonkin. Yeah. Uh, everything else that had happened, and I just I couldn't, in good conscience. Uh, feel that I had earned the beret and not gone to Vietnam mm. in order to serve uh, in what 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 I thought was actually a, a, a noble cause because mm. I, I believed yes there was such a thing as the as the domino effect and that mm. the comments were looking out were, were that there was a, a unified communist uh, uh, Conspiracy, for lack of to, mm-hmm. to to change the world, they wanted to convert the whole world into communism. Right. Yeah. And uh, and you had to make a stand somewhere. And I thought uh, 
that was it. And also, once again, for personal reasons, like I just really would have felt that I hadn't done my duty mm. the, way, uh, the way that I should if I hadn't gone to Vietnam. Do you, so do you, I, went, I went to Washington, D.C. and actually actually uh, went to the Pentagon and found the guy who controlled all of those. And, and uh, he, he thought I was a little bit nuts, but mm. he, he changed the orders and set me up for Vietnam. And do you, do you, and, and how much time, how much time went by before, you know, in between that, going to the Pentagon and then actually setting foot in Nha Trang? Oh, well, I had to go through pre-mission training and I think our pre-mission training was eight, eight, eight or nine weeks. So, okay. uh, I, we didn't, we didn't actually land in Nha Trang until I think it was January 4th. We, we took a leave, a Christmas leave, came back on the first, and I think on the second, we started our flight over. Uh, we wanted to see 124 with all of our equipment. Yeah. Uh, and went over as one team, and we flew over, and it took uh, the better part of two and a half days. Mm. And I don't know if we, I, I don't know if we picked up a day or lost a day in the international. I think you picked one up, yeah. Yeah, we picked one up. Yeah. So yeah. It was, I think it was January, January third uh, or fourth when we actually landed in the train. And three days later, um, we were in our. We were two days later. We were sent to Da Nang, and three days later, they split up our team, and uh, half of our team went to uh, to Trabong, and the others were split up. Uh, that's when my assistant team leader and and the, the team sergeant went elsewhere, along with uh, I forget who else we lost. I I think the we yeah the uh, senior our senior medic uh, went elsewhere. So you 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 spent your tour in Vietnam then in I Corps, in I Corps and specifically in Trabong. Uh, initially, when we got into Da Nang, uh, I found this out from Ray Morris, our assistant team leader. The uh, they wanted to send me to Ashau, and I, if you're familiar with the Battle of Ashau and yeah. all of that, yeah. I was very fortunate in that regard because uh, the, the, my my uh, not my, my assistant team leader because he was going elsewhere but uh, but the, the uh, light re weapon sergeant uh, Jacobson went to went to the captain and said no you want to you want to keep Barnes you, know, you, you want to keep him on the team and mm. so and then an argued for him to go to Trabong with him and uh, anyhow that's yeah, how we yeah. ended up Trabong yeah well um, unlike I think a lot of I think probably the large majority of um, forces who, who get into Vietnam, uh, I think unlike the large majority of them who go to Vietnam for the first time, um, you, you had some combat experience given what, what you'd experienced in, in the Dominican Republic. Um, and so you kind of, you know, you had, you know, at least uh, some experience that, that you could sort of rely on, I imagine, as you're, as you're making the flight over. Um, when did it become real to you, or when did the point really get driven home to you that that this was a much bigger thing? I'm, I'm sure you knew in the abstract that Vietnam is a much bigger thing than the, the Dominican Republic. But when did that cease being abstract, and when did that become concrete for you that, okay, this Vietnam thing is a much more serious, serious thing? I think probably when we flew into our camp, because we took... Uh, 50 caliber fire uh, going into our camp uh, in the aircraft. At, at, at Trabong? At, at Trabong. You go up the, yeah, you go up the valley there, yeah. the Trabong Valley, uh, um, and that whole shear on either side, uh, it, well, that is the shear, Trabong, that mounts to the west of, of Trabong. Yeah. But, uh, the, it's in a valley, so there's mountains on both sides, and uh, the, on the north side, we consistently took uh, 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 fire from either a 50 caliber or somebody with the, with a BAR down there firing up in the air. They weren't very, very accurate. They never hit an aircraft. But yeah, uh, you know that you know that when you're heading in and you're you're under fire already, that this is real. Yeah. Um, now you know Army in general did did year long tours. Was the same true for Special Forces? Were you there for a year? A year, yeah. Except I, I was only there for 11 months because my discharge date came up. I see. Okay. Well, um, 
I guess I'll just, you know, my next question will be very broad. Um, and I'm just interested in what, what sort of operations did, did you do? I know that, or my understanding is that, that you did some work with the Montagnards. It would be interesting to hear about that. And I'm sure you did a, a lot of different kinds of things, but just what's your first response to that, that question? What sorts of operations did you, uh, did you engage in? Uh, let me, let me start with what happened in our camp. Um, okay. our, our, our captain was, the Australians had really created a rift between themselves and the, and our Vietnamese counterparts, the Vietnamese special forces. Hmm. And, uh, so what our captain initially did, uh, when we went in there after Captain Field was, he was an idealist. He was a typical, uh, JFK idealist he's going to change the world he's going to make it a better place yeah and he wanted to he wanted to heal all those rifts between us and the vietnamese special forces and so we tore down uh, well he had me tear down the fence that, that the australians had constructed between between our camp and the others and put a gate in there so that they were they felt welcome to come into our camp at any time yeah and vice versa and then um at an early test, they had an early test session in celebration, and we all sat down at the table. And, and so there was there was this idea that we we were mutual comrades in arms, mm -hmm. and that we had a we had a common mission. And he he wanted to make sure that that the, that the, everybody understood that, including the district district chief, because we would be working with the PF uh, the popular force. Uh, and soldiers as well as with the CIDG, the Civilian Air Irregular Defense, the soldiers that were in our camp. Yeah. Uh, and and it, it was nice. They had a big celebration the first day of Tet, and then it started raining. And then that night, a popular force outpost was overrun down the valley. Mm. And uh, there was this big meeting that I wasn't privy to it because I was uh, one of the two lowest ranking guys. On, I was an E5 and I was one of the, uh, you know, to, you know, in cap and everything. And uh, so Norwood, the medic, who was an E4, and I were uh, excluded from any of those meetings that they had, but they did a big powwow with they were trying to decide what they were going to do. Yeah. And uh, this, we, in the meantime, we, 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 were on guard, uh, standing, standing outside in the, in the in the in the trenches and everything, and watching watching the the, the camp get overrun. You saw it's that forces camp get overrun. Wow! And then after it was overrun, uh, probably within twenty to thirty minutes, it began. They you'd hear these single shots mm. going down the valley, and you knew what had happened was that they were taking people that were prisoners, the ones that wouldn't join with the Viet Cong and executing them. So these these are Viet Cong executing South Vietnamese special forces? Right. No, not special forces. Okay. These, these were popular force. Oh, popular, popular force. force. Okay, yeah. They were, under, they were under the control of the district chief. Yeah. So so what, what you had was a situation where you real you realized the the gravity of everything. Mm. And, and that the, the, the popular force guerrillas down there weren't the ones that were doing that. It was rather, this was, a, this was it, as it ends up, it was a battalion of what they called the regional force guerrillas. Uh, and they overran that. The next day, my captain, uh, after they had this big powwow and everything else, uh, took that force, took, uh, I was supposed to go on the operation. I was next one due up on operation. I was dressed to go out. He said, take your clothes off or take your take your gear off, uh, uh, Sergeant, you're not going. Uh, I'm going to take Jacobson and say, well, Jacobson had been on the last operation. He, he really wasn't supposed to go. Took him and Brownie and Pablo, who was the other one that was supposed to go, and I stayed stayed back in camp. Mm. And they went down there with uh, the four Americans, Bruce Schneider, Captain Buell, Jacobson, and Brownie. And they went down the valley with about – a hundred combined force of about a hundred uh, uh, popular force and CIDG from our camp. They left, uh, I think they left one, one full uh, platoon and one full company back in camp and everybody else went out. And uh, 
all four of the Americans got killed. Wow. Uh, our, cat, our captain, we found out later, got taken to a nearby pagoda, and as he was wounded, and they, they took him there and assassinated him. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I, I think there's about, I, I don't know the full thing, uh, the exact figures, but there was somewhere between 45 and 50 uh, KIA's uh, popular force and and uh, and uh, our CIDG that got killed at the same time. Mm. So here's the operations. That's, that's I had to set that up. Yeah. Most of our operations that occurred occurred uh, combat operations occurred going east into the valley to these these villages that were controlled or near those villages that were controlled uh, by the by the local force. And m most of our, com our, our combat contacts after that were with these local force guerrillas. So fighting uh, Viet, Cong, Viet Cong. Yeah, the Viet Cong. Yeah. And, and we, uh, in a couple of, we burned the village down one time, evacuated, burned it, uh, burned a lot of, like, you know, it did the same thing that the conventional forces did. Yeah. Uh, we probably killed more of them than we lost from yeah. at, at first that initial that battle in January and January twenty second. Yeah. So, so what we ended up with was uh, after that uh, we we ended up mostly doing I I did because I they assigned me uh, when I I went off for for. For, I don't know, I, R and R, and I came back from R and R, and they said, "Okay, uh, you can either transfer out of camp, or we'll put you in uh, as the advisor to the combat B conflict, which were all mountain yards." Yeah. Uh, except, except for the squad leaders, and of course, Trung Si Ku, who went with me, uh, the Vietnamese uh, command sergeant. Um, so I couldn't. I, I felt like you know, I knew that area. I'd gone over and most. Of, from that time forward, most of my operations were actually not operations, but just long-range patrols hunting up and down mountains and, okay. and going out for three, three or four or five days, uh, and you know, and coming and getting and going from when I hit in country, going from 188 pounds down to about 170. Yeah, and so these are sort of LERP operations. Uh, well, it would be, yeah, kind of like that. It, we, what we would do is if we saw something uh, that was suspicious, yeah. uh, we would call in an airstrike on it, they, the, and we'd get the B-52s, so we'd get the jets. Yeah. Uh, jets. This yeah. is 1967? This was 19, is 1966. 66. Six, all of it is 66. No. And so, go ahead. Oh, well, I just wanted to pick up on something, because you, you described these... Um, Viet Cong assassinating prisoners, uh, Viet Cong uh, assassinating a, a wounded American prisoner, assassinating uh, fellow South Vietnamese who are fighting on the opposite side in the Civil War. And my mind is listening to that. My mind goes to this uh, short story of yours I read. And uh, now I've heard A. Shaw Valley, and then, but then you've, I think you've pronounced it a little bit different. Um, but the, 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 the short, the short story is a lovely day in the Asha or the Asha. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. How, how do you Asha. pronounce that? Asha Valley. The Asha Valley. So a lovely Asha. day in the, in the Asha Valley. And, um, the, the first uh, couple sentences of, um, of this story are wonderful. I'll just read those real quick. Marines at Marble Mountain claimed Asha was filled with juju. MACV intelligence said it was filled with a regiment of North Vietnamese. In either case, it was one bad place to go. And I thought those are those are great lines. But in this story, you've got these guys out on patrol. They come across some NVA who come out with uh, white flags. And then the question is, well, do you want to surrender or do you want us to surrender? And what the NVA uh, officer actually wants to do is to play a baseball game. And, uh, you know, when the story went that way, I thought, oh, wow, okay, this is heading off in the pretty strange direction. Uh, but by the time I got to the end of the story, I, I really appreciated its cleverness. But what, what comes to my mind, uh, what came to my mind as, as I was listening to you a minute ago, was that in the story, you recount that the North Vietnamese were really interested in playing baseball, but at the same time, they didn't really seem to be very interested in the rules. And uh, 
they kind of played baseball in, in their own way and not really according to the rules of baseball. Um, in that story, are you kind of getting at what you're describing, that this is an enemy, that we're playing the same game, that is the game of war, but, but the enemy doesn't play by the rules? Okay, yeah, well, essentially that's it. I mean, it's, it's an allegory. It, we have to begin with the notion, of course, that if there's two things that Americans traditionally were good at, and these are both our national game, in a way, it's war and baseball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happened in Vietnam was that the rules of war, as we understood them, uh, were altered. Yeah. In that, instead of taking land and controlling the land, as we had in previous wars, because we were fighting conventional forces, defeating them, taking the land, controlling it, reestablishing order. Right. What we did over there, and, and Westmoreland, by and large, is responsible for this, coming up with this strategy of body count. Yeah. Body count. Right. And, and we did. We, we won. We won, and we won, and we won, determined on the idea of body count. Yeah. But, but, but we didn't pacify the country. We didn't, we didn't really win the hearts and minds of the people because the minds, the hearts and minds of the people were on the next bowl of rice mm. and, and who was going to best provide it for them and whoever had it. And they were, it was a nation where, where the people were all good people in essence, but philosophically and politically, they were highly divided. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. And, the rules of war, as we understand them and conduct them, everything else uh, didn't include things like shooting prisoners or doing this. Uh, so when the when the North Vietnamese established a baseball game wherein you were going to play until the balls were all gone, mm. Mm -hmm. and score didn't matter. Yeah, uh, they they controlled they controlled the narrative of the war. And the, and the so, game goes for so, 20 innings, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, with, with, yeah uh, instead of nine innings and the Americans are ahead, so you quit. And, you, and obviously, mm. the, 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 it, it ends with, with the, the captain saying, do you want to play baseball again tomorrow? And, uh, and uh, the North Vietnamese colonel says, we can't forget what we're here for. Mm. Yeah, and that's and, and and that's the irony is that is that Americans in time did forget what they went there for because the rules had changed so much that they couldn't be certain of any of it. Mm. Well, for that reason, I, I encourage folks, you know, not to read only that story, but to read read that story. There's, um, it is a it 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 works, and it's it's great to hear you talk about that story. Um, as an allegory of some of the things in the war. Something else I recall from the story is um, that there is a battle, and again, the details, I may, I may have some of these wrong, so please do correct me, but, um, you know, the story says it begins with the sappers, and so, you know, the small number of sort of uh, attackers uh, at the very leading edge, but then, but then it's followed up by other forces, and you end up with bodies piled up, bodies piled up, bodies piled up. And, and the enemy is just getting hammered, right? I mean, the, the casualties are crazy. They're losing, right? Uh, and, at least in terms of body count. But then, if I remember correctly, the next morning, all the bodies are gone. Right. And it's like this enemy that is absorbing tremendous casualties. It's also incredibly elusive. Um, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'll end my sentence there and, and let you pick it up. I'm just wondering... You know, what, what, what's going through your mind as you're putting that down on paper? Well, that actually did happen. Uh, one of the things that they, they would do is they would send in people actually to lay, throw their bodies down on top of concertina so that the others could climb over the, the backs of their bodies. Wow. And, yeah. uh, and gunfire would kill them and everything else. And that, so they just keep piling up. But they would come back and retrieve their bodies often. Uh, Often that's why body counts in battles were were askew because they, mm. they couldn't be certain because the, the the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong would come in and re recover their bodies. Yeah, and they were absolutely elusive. Uh, we would we would see signs of them on those long range patrols. Yeah, but we wouldn't see them. Mm. 
so what we, I mean, I, we stumbled upon a, 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 one of their hospitals or med, med stations uh, at one time that was dug into the side of, the, uh, of a cliff and, and uh, there was all sorts of signs that they had been there recently, but we didn't see any of them. Wow. So the wow. angels saw us and dis and, and DD'd out of there or, or um, mm. somebody had met them and they DD'd out of there. Yeah, um, yeah. And right you, you, I'm sorry. Yeah, right by us. I mean, they must yes. have disappeared right by us. Yeah, and and you just used the the uh, Vietnamese verb for you know to to go with d right and dd right is to is to go. So they yeah, they yeah. they got out of there. Um, I'm interested in your own your own sense of of the enemy. So you describe an enemy that is ruthless. Um, basically murdering prisoners. Um, you have an enemy that is that is willing to sustain mind-boggling casualties, elusive, obviously quite intelligent. Um, some veterans say that they felt intense hatred for the enemy. Some say that they couldn't help but feel some sense of respect. Some say they felt a mix. What what was your own your own sense of it? Well, in the I had four teammates killed, um, uh, so my sense of it is I yeah. wanted to kill as many of them as possible. Yeah, or to do as much damage to them. I mean, uh, it, it, because you start taking it personally. And the other thing yeah. is that you, you 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 do respect them in the sense that they are dangerous. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't have a lot of respect for them as as trained soldiers in the sense that we were. They weren't very good shots. Mm. I mean, I can't tell you. I mean, I probably pro probably went on four or five uh, combat operations down the valley where we came under sniper fire, and and I mean, I, they whizzed by. I, you know, this, the first time I went down there, one bullet went, was whizzed right by my head. Wow! And I thought, I I, I thought, wow! Well, I I kneeled down and I took careful aim and I saw where the, the next time he fired I saw where the smoke came from and uh, and uh, and I, I let loose right on that target so mm. uh, the, that's the difference between us and them is that generally speaking we have we were more disciplined uh, mm. uh, in in the way that we you I mean it, it, sure we sprayed a lot we sprayed a lot of uh, weapons when we came under fire I mean a lot of ammunition when we came under fire but yeah. generally speaking we were more disciplined about how we did it yeah yeah Right, so I, I get that there's there's a kind of respect for the the endurance and the evasiveness, et cetera, but at the same time recognizing usually in a toe to toe scrap they're going to lose. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, 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 you, if you if you if you if you look at the balance of how many casualties we lost, which is still a pretty staggering. A lot, right? yeah. You know, KIAs and and but WIAs more wounded and everything else compared to the, what they suffered. Yeah, uh, we were far more effective. Uh, yeah. Well, in, in combat, did you and then? That's, and that's not even including it, 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 just disregarding the fact that we had air power. Yeah, right. Did did you then <coughs> share the view, which you know, I mean, I assume made perfect sense in '66, because you know '66 is still things are heating up, but you know, the Tet Offensive of '68 is 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 still to come. It's a ways down the road. I think it it, it would make sense to a lot of people saying, you know what, I mean, the body counts they're taking, the casualties they're taking compared to the casualties we're taking, they're, they're taking, you know, the, the casualties they're taking are, are astronomical compared to ours, and there's no possible way they can keep this up. Therefore, we're going to win. Um, that was was, that, that, was that your sense? Uh, actually, actually, uh, you know, if we... In my way, of, in, in my way of thinking, everything was too personal, uh, too narrow. I, I couldn't. But but by 1968, as after I was gone and everything else, I pro probably by by that time I was not anti-war, but I was certainly uh, seeing the war in a different way, uh, politically and and strategically, mm. and uh, and that we 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 weren't going to win. If uh, if we didn't get the, both the sentiment of the American people behind us, mm. and if we didn't have the the, the 
full dedication of the South Vietnamese to this. And mm. I, it, it was obvious that we didn't have either. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so, so after that, after that, it was, a, in my mind, it, was a, it wasn't a question of whether we were going to win or lose. It was a question of how we were going to extricate ourselves yeah. from, as a nation from, from that mess. I mean, it's not like I'm not a bright guy. I, you know, I, it, I <laughs> tried not to, when you're a, a soldier and you're in, com, in a combat zone, you don't think in macro terms. You think in the micro terms. Um, right, yeah. You've got, to, you've, got, you've got to do this, you've sure. got to do that. Yeah, yeah. The, I've heard a lot of veterans say, "Look, for me, the war was me and the guy next to me. That was that was pretty much the war um, for me." There, there are a lot of questions that I, that I want to ask, but um, uh, we'll 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 begin to 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 wind down. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll restrict it. Um, you, you're just mentioning that, um, or you you just you know referred to the fact that the that the the government of South Vietnam or the the government of the South Vietnam, the, the army of South Vietnam, uh, it didn't seem like they were ever really a, ever in a, in a place to, um, to, to win the war on their own. And you, you hear that a lot. Um, what about the South Vietnamese special forces that you worked with? Did, did you, did you find that they were generally reliable? Um, well, I didn't work with a lot of them. I worked okay. almost exclusively with with uh, Trung Si Ku, who was the the, uh, the special forces command sergeant or or team sergeant, if you will. Okay. Uh, and and he had he he fought the Japanese in World War II, and he fought on the side of the French. Oh wow! Uh, and then he uh, so he he had this whole history behind him, and, and I knew no matter what he was he was there. And I, I, in one in one operation we went on uh, an early one in fact I think it was the third one I went out on or come you know come out on operation um, we came under fire and uh, and he took he took a ricocheted bullet in the arm wrapped it up and went up went up to his, his soldiers there and kicked them in the butt and made them stand up <laughs> wow. <laughs> He was stand up. If we, it, he would stay with him. He, he was considerably older than I was, and uh, and uh, he would stay up with the mountain yards, who were incredible in the mountains. Because mm. um, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't skirt skirt the mountains. We went up, right, straight up and down, and up and down. Uh, that's yeah. what the mountain yards did. Wow. And he he held his. I I knew I knew that he he was dependable. And he, yeah. I, it's, it would be hard to describe what we had uh, as a friendship, but it was just, I think it was just a uh, mutual sense of, of, of uh, re relying on one another. Yeah. Knowing we could. Yeah. So in that case, you've got a, a reliable ally and a, a South Vietnamese soldier, but unfortunately, you know, the, I hear of some exceptions, but as I'm sure, you know, you, you've heard many times as well, the general sense is, that our South Vietnamese allies were, were not um, were not so dependable, but tell us about these these mountain yards. Uh, you know, just what comes to mind when you think of them. You, you mentioned them just now. Uh, these um, these other allies that we had in in South Vietnam. Uh, to this to this day, there's a there's a, uh, a connection between the mountain yards and the soldiers in special forces that worked with them. In fact, uh, we sponsored our, our unit, Special Forces uh, Association uh, uh, has sponsored uh, bringing them into this country and helping them establish in, in communities here, uh, especially around North Carolina. Mm. Uh, they are, you could liken them to perhaps Native Americans in a way, the, mm. the, their tribal sense of things, their understanding of nature, and they're, they're, they're these rather stout, uh, the men anyhow, are these stout, sinuous uh, kinds of guys. Yeah. And they have, a, they have a tremendous sense of loyalty uh, to, to us. They, they were, and I found out later on that because I, I, was, a blonde, I was this young blonde guy with blue eyes and everything else, that they that they 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 thought that I had a special spirit. Oh, I mean that's wow. that's the only way to explain it. So yeah. I mean if, that I, that because of that that they felt safe with me. And when we went on combat operations, I would I, I would have one of them carry a fifty seven recoilless rifle with with uh, for me. 
Mm. And another one, Terry, uh, the AME, uh, uh, HE, the um, high explosives, and another one carried the Willie Peter rounds so the uh, white phosphorus. And, and they stuck by me because yeah. when we came under fire or something, I, I would pull out that, I, I load up, have them load up that 57, and whatever the target was, well, I try to take it out. And uh, so they stuck right by me. They, 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 the ones, and that was a heavy load for them to carry. Sure. You know, carrying four or five um, high explosives and four or five uh, Willie Peter rounds yeah. in their backpacks. So were, were the Montagnards, were, were they combatants or, or were they more helping, like, you know, with carrying supplies and things like that? Or a combination? They were soldiers. They, were soldiers. they carried they were soldiers. their own weapons, too. Yeah. So, I mean, they were they, yeah. were, they, oh. were, they were servants. They right. were servants. This was just everybody carrying the load that they needed to, to, to carry, so that the, so that the uh, so that we all go out and do what we had to do, and then come back safely. Yeah, and this was. Um, would you describe this as sort of a, a an enemy of my enemy is my friend thing, and that the Montagnards, as an ethnic minority in Vietnam, had faced some. Um, prejudice, discrimination, oppression from the Vietnamese government, and they saw the American and Australian forces as kind of a way to get back at the Vietnamese government. Is that correct? No, I would guess that they didn't actually have much regard for Australians. If, once you read the memoir, you'll understand. Why. Okay, okay. Uh, but I think I think they had a dip, deeper connection. More than anything else, it was because the mountaineers, of course, were mountain people. They grew their rice on the side of the mountains. They they hunted. They trapped. They did. Uh, they fished. They did the things that they had to to survive. But the the Viet the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese both came into mountaineer villages and, and kidnapped uh, the young men, made them fight with them. Mm. Uh, they would take their rice supply. They would do all those things. That, so the mountaineer had no love for the Viet Cong. Right. Okay. And in some ways, one of the reasons that they were they were they were so loyal to us and everything else is that it was again that the enemy of my enemy is your friend. Yeah. But I think I think it extends beyond that. I think because of their own culture, because they're warrior culture, they're like, as I said, Native Americans, that they, that they bond with the, with the idea of somebody else being a, a warrior on their side. Mm. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's difficult. It's difficult for people in politics and academia to understand that kind of, because they, they have an experience. They, they, yeah. Just don't understand that that deeper com, uh, thread of camaraderie that takes place when when lives are at, at risk and and one's willing to sacrifice for the other to mm. do what's necessary. Yeah. Two two more questions, and and the last question will be: I, I know that you wanted to, uh, or you have an interest in speaking on the topic of of stolen valor, and so that would be the last question. But before I ask that one, the, so the next last one. I think kind of picks up with with where you just were, sort of talking about that bond, of um, that bond among warriors, and one of the things that I, I hear um, somewhat frequently from combat veterans is this paradox that they'll say, "War is war is awful. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible, horrific thing," and at the same time, combat is awesome. And there's nothing in the civilian world that is as thrilling. And so, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's horrible. On the other hand, there's something awesome and thrilling about it. What, what's your take on, on that? Well, okay. I guess the best way to, to, to put this uh, for me is that, uh, is that there's something absolutely honest about what takes place in combat or combat zones. Mm. And if we look at the rest of society and the way it operates, there's mm. there's a huge amount of hypocrisy. Mm. And there, there's no room for hypocrisy in a combat unit. Mm. Uh, I hear that. And to, to this day, I, mean, I, I stay in touch with, uh, unfortunately, uh, Norwood has got, uh, he's, he's ill and he's got dementia. Mm. And so I, we don't contact anymore, but I stay in touch with 
Fritz Macher and 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 uh, and and Ray Norris and and others who I served with over there. We we keep keep in contact. Yeah, uh, Hank Lucy from time to time because we have a we have that long history and we know each other's stories. And yeah, when you we don't you know here here's what you want to remember is that. Is that war story? If you hear somebody telling war stories about how they they were brave and they did this and they you know blah blah blah, mm. it's probably BS mm. because the real war stories are things like the story I tell about Hank Luthi when we went on uh, on a on a long range patrol. He came back from Quang Nai and and we headed out of camp early first thing in the morning and and uh, he pulled out his backpack uh, about mid noon because and, and and he was get some water and he sat there and he reached in his and he'd been uh, three days in the train mm. uh, he reached in his backpack and pulled out a pair of pink underwear and started wiping his forehead with them <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, I, mm. he didn't he wasn't even aware of it i said hank hank <laughs> he looked at me with oh okay and he just kept wiping his forehead those yeah. those are war stories those those are the honest stories those are the stories we tell yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if if I may, for just a moment, would regress a little bit. Sure. One of the reasons I wrote uh, the Gunning for Hope, which is the title story, and you haven't read it yet. Yeah. Uh, is that Gunning for Hope is set in Trabong, short story, mm. and of course, of course, uh, um, Tim O'Brien wrote the Sweetheart or the Prince. Yeah, I think Sweetheart Trabong. Mm. And I kind of sat down to write a story that was going to be, okay, look, this is what your bonks really like. And that one also gets allegorical. Yeah. Uh, and it's the, I think it's the first time in fiction that a suicide bomber was captured in a story. Wow. So read for that. Yeah. Uh, almost, almost sentient when I was reading, when I was writing it. Mm. But, but I wanted to, I wanted to answer it in a different way because, uh, because I know what he was doing. That was his, kind of shot at allegory, but but Tim O'Brien's work, early work, and some of his, you know, as he kept writing about Vietnam, catered to to a different sensibility, a civilian sensibility about the war mm. that emerged with, with the anti-war movement and, and people who were more liberal and everything else. Yeah. And, and I think it, 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 when, he, when he wrote the things they carried, he was right on with that particular story. But in other ways, uh, his work reflected the other sentiment about the war, as opposed to the sentiment that soldiers in combat really feel. And I, I, mm. I think on fiction, I try to ca- I try to capture that in, a, in a, more of that sensibility. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate that, and and you know, and and I, I, um, I mean, I'll just say this: I've, I've, I've had a book about Vietnam going, I think, continuously. Ugh, for probably twelve years, um, but the the one short story I I, I read just this morning, um, a lovely day in the Ashaw Ashaw Valley, uh, it was unlike anything else from the Vietnam War that I that I've read. Or it's a short story, obviously it's fictional, uh, but it's quite a, quite original and quite thought provoking. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. I well, I mean, so I, I actually wrote it for a readership. Now, unfortunately, but the readership has only been about twenty-eight hundred people. So oh, <laughs> well, that's, I, over a, that's over a period of almost twenty years. So. Oh boy. Well, so I'm just on uh, you. You kind of uh, touched on on this just a little bit. Um, the guys who tell stories that probably aren't true, and so this gets to then to the last question then about. Stolen Valor, or or the last the last theme, and I guess I'll just I'll just leave it to you. I mean, what 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 do you want to say on that on that theme of you know the guys who may uh, maybe are wearing the Vietnam veteran hat, but you know um, you know you you talk to them and you find out well, and like one guy I talked to you know who had the who had the hat on, and it turns out that he was on a ship that you know made a a port stop there for like two days, and that was the extent of his experience in Vietnam. Um, what, what, just what, what do you want to say on that theme of stolen valor? Well, there's a, 
there's the degrees of uh, in which somebody uses it to defraud the government or or make a claim politically, you know, that they were in the war. And that, uh, mm. I think we had a senator that did that not long ago, uh, that, that, that has done that, right? Uh, absolutely, I, absolutely. And that should be, that should, of course, be, be the death, death knell for, for a politician in yeah. terms of get, keep holding office. Yeah, but, I agree. Uh, the, the other thing is, it's not just the people who tell the, the project of war stories, but we see these people dressed. I, I, when I was at uh, the Veterans uh, VA facility in North Vegas uh, about three years ago, I walked out and here was this guy with uh, special forces symbols and blah, blah, blah. And he was just this tall, thin, black guy. I'd never seen him before. Yeah. So right, right away, I asked him, I said, what group are you in? And he he, he kind of hesitated. And then he said, oh, uh, I said, well, what you, you know, and he was about my age. Mm. And I said, well, you know, what, what, what C team were you with? What, what, uh, he, and he said he was with something like that. I was with the, the 507s. We were a special assassination group and blah, blah, blah. And I was a sniper. And I, and he starts telling the story. He says, he says, uh, he says, yeah. And he says, I'm, I'm here trying to get, you know, get treatment because I, you know, I shot, I shot women and children. And I'm thinking snipers, first of all, we didn't have snipers, mm. special second of all snipers don't shoot women and children they mm. shoot the target you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Mm. so i mean I, I just finally looked at him and said you know you're a phony you should take that crap off mm. but I, over the years i had experienced others who our unit more than any other you know sickness false claim there's people who claim that they were in special forces mm. and it it does a disservice in fact out here where i live there's a, a particular guy who he, apparently he was a he was a rigger, which you know is fine. That's that's what you do in the search. We, you know, need someone's got to rig the air. But he they claimed that he was recruited into special forces and he was on a team in in Cameron Bay. Well, we mm. didn't have a teams in Cameron Bay, and mm. I was working with the with the veterans court, where we help veterans who are we we work as counselors, sort of as counselors. Yeah. Uh, mentors actually for for these veterans who, who who are trying to serve get rid of their their record and everything else by doing doing community service and other things and yeah this guy was this guy was one of the mentors down there and he's a fraud oh gosh. and yeah. i told I, I told the guy that that was in in charge of the mentors group i said you know i, I can't stand to be in a room with a guy that's a phony i just yeah, can't yeah yeah uh, yeah so so mm. it's not it's not it's not i mean we have to be and I, you know, I have to say this: that most of these young people who are coming back from Iraq and and, and Afghanistan, yeah, I haven't. I've talked to some of them. They don't have those phony stories. I haven't seen any of anybody that's laying false claim there. Because mm -hmm. I think I think there's a different regard for soldiers now than there was when we came back. Yeah. Oh yeah. And the ones, one group of soldiers, or the two groups of soldiers that got the most regard, or three would be Marines, Special Forces, and SEALs. Yeah. So people who would make false claims would make it on those. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I mean, I could, you know, I, I wonder what, what that's about, you know, what sort of what's driving that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure books have been written on the, on the theme. Um, you know, I don't know, some guy who looks, who served maybe, but, you know, looks back and wishes that he had more, more glorious stories to tell, but as as you've indicated, you know the the folks who are actually out there doing a lot of this tough stuff. You know they may write about it and they may talk about it at past, but but it's not usually something they're broadcasting to planet Earth in I, in I sort of a chilly way. I, I often give talks at uh, veteran at, on Veterans Day or Memorial Day, and one of the things that I use as a metaphor when I'm talking about it is that uh, you know. But we have to honor veterans. I said, not everybody who's on a football team scores a touchdown. Yeah. One person scores the touchdown. Yeah. But somebody's blocking, somebody's doing a feint to the other, somebody's distracting them, somebody's throwing the ball. It's all part of what makes that touchdown work. Yeah. So exactly. any service in the military is honorable service. Right. And take and respect what you did yeah. uh, because you're actually doing, being disrespectful for what you did in the service yeah. by, by laying these false claims. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I, I hear that. I hear that. And I really appreciate it. So as, as we're, we're at the end now, H. Lee Barnes, I, I really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, and uh, thank you for your, your writing on these, uh, you know, reflecting on your experiences, both in memoir form and, uh, and uh, in, in, the, in short story form. Uh, thanks for, for speaking about your experiences. And, and I hope that, that other veterans who um, are reluctant to share, I, I hope that they'll be encouraged to share. Um, the, the general story of the Vietnam War is not in danger of being lost. Hundreds of books have, have been written. But every individual's story matters. And so I, I really hope that those individual vets out there who, who are reluctant to share, I, I, I hope that, that they'll be encouraged to um, to make their memories part of the part of the record, and and I on the part of other veterans and everything is thank you for the work that you're doing. Yeah. We, we we want we want we want to have our stories recorded so that there so that there's a fuller history. Yeah, well, well, we're on, in that respect we're on the same team, and so I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks very much.